What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Vitamin Lead, your healthy dose of leadership. I'm your host, TJ Reed, and I am excited to have with me today, Marion Renu. Did I get that right, Marion? Perfect, TJ. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome. So we're so glad to have you. Why, uh, our listeners have heard a little bit of your bio, but why don't you tell us about yourself? Yes, absolutely. So um, I was born in the south of France, which is why I have a very French last name. and um, Grew up uh, over there and then moved to England as I um, studied and finishing up uh, getting my degrees in marketing. And um, I uh, um, started my career there in London. I spent nine years over there. And eventually um, I got this job at Amazon that got me to move to Seattle in uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, to the headquarters, basically. And um, that equate to about 15 years in the digital and tech industry, hmm. where, you know, I learn from the best, the hard way, what it's like to work in a high, you know, velocity, fast paced industry and company. And today I've decided to condense all of this work and all of those learnings into uh, my coaching practice called Fierce and Charming. And as of a couple of days, I recently relocated to Barcelona to just get a little bit more sun and vitamin D uh, on a daily basis. I heard it's a lot more than probably Seattle to the, the, the sun and, and heat there. <laughs> definitely, definitely a big change. Well, congratulations on that. And thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself. I love that name, uh, Fierce and Charming Coaching. How did you come up with that? Yeah, um, so fierce and charming is a, a term that I coined with my husband. Um, I'm fierce, he's charming. <laughs> um, and that's to represent the balance between um, the sort of rigor of mechanisms and processes and the more intangible sort of um, flexibility of you know, people's emotions, relationships and connection, which is the charming side. And if you put them together and really think about you know, how to approach situations, whether they're at work or personally, that might be difficult or challenging, there's always a little bit of you know, uh, structure and rigor and processes that you can apply, but also thinking about relationships and communication and more of the softer side of your skill set. Put together, uh, this create this sort of, you know, approach and magical uh, way of handling whether it's personal or professional situations. Hmm. Do, do you find that most situations require kind of like the, the union of both of those or um, in a typical like executive's work day, is it you're leaning on the gas in the morning on the fierce and then you're leaning on the gas on the charming uh, later in the day or is it a combination mm -hmm. most of the time of both? I would say it's a combination most of the time. And, you know, it comes from an instinct sort of, um, you know, basis when you want to figure out, do I want to be more charming or do I want to be more fierce in this situation? You know, it's on a case by case basis. But what's interesting is, you know, um, I was, you know, referring to my husband and I um, tend to be more fierce, and I'm, but I'm learning to be a bit more charming at times and understand a little bit of soft skills or underlying, um, considerations or or sort of what is the why what's motivating people that helps me then you know apply more rigorous more mechanical sort of techniques to to a situation so it depends not easily on the day but depends on the situation the people and, and where you are uh, at any point yeah I, th I think I'd find myself on the fierce side as well with you there. I've had to do a lot of uh, reading and learning from Brene Brown and others to learn empathy for other people and things like that. She's great. She's a really, I'm glad that you're bringing her um, up. She's a, she's a really interesting author. Her Dare to Lead book is really interesting because up until this book, she really spoke to the, the charming side. It's very emotional. It's about, you know, her work on shame. With Dare to Lead, she combines the fear side of the business side with the sort of more um, emotional side of her work. Yeah, she was the first person that, that, that was the first of her books that I read. And I read it last summer. There's an exercise in there where you kind of choose the values that really define your work and stuff like that. And that was actually what led to, I'm in the middle of a job transition right now, but defining those values is what actually really helped me to realize where I kind of wanted to go in my career. So I'm grateful for that Dare to Lead book. Yeah, I love that. I think it's really interesting. And, and sometimes um, those 
exercises are great because they help you um, um, create a tangible throughput of, you know, qualities, values, or, or, or concepts that you're not fully aware of until, you know, you get an exercise, whether it's Brené Brown's values or Strength Finder, you know, um, once you get that framework that helps you categorize sort of things that you don't really you just live with you start mixing the charming you know the side side of you that is something that's innate and you've always been like that with the with the fears which is like what is the framework and what is the structure that allow me to really understand my you know humanity in a in a more with a framework basically with a more rigid context that's good i like that it provides the framework for that that's really good so your mission is to accelerate the rise of strong women leaders with enormous poten potential. And that's, that's so crucial, right? Um, did you decide to do this because you experienced the opposite uh, in your career? Exactly. Working in the tech industry means working in a highly male-dominated environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard for everybody. But it's specifically hard for women in a sense that the higher you look up the corporate ladder, the lesser women you see. So yeah. you don't have any role models. You don't have any ally. You don't have any support. I mean, you do have allies and supports in your male managers and, and skip levels. But it's difficult when you don't really have a, a role model, someone that you can look up to and, and work with, someone that truly understands the you know, nature of you know, feminine qualities and, and, and psyche. Um, so yes, I've been there and, you know, I always did pretty well in a male dominated environment. It's never been something that I was fully, you know, consciously aware of, um, up until the point I, you know, reached a level of seniority in my career where I realized that a lot of women are impacted and a lot of women are frustrated and discouraged mm. and, same as you finding your value, I realized that my value, my values align with helping, yeah. coaching and mentoring and raising the profile of women, helping them shift from, you know, what got them to where they are to what's going to help them break through the glass ceiling and break through to the next level. If you had to like uh, forecast out like how many years, decades would it take to where we start to see more of that? Uh, I guess, feminine uh, influence on the higher exec levels of organizations. Are, are we, I'm sure we're seeing some more of that, but maybe not as much as we'd like to see. Yeah, I think it's Unilever that announced recently that they have a 50-50 uh, gender uh, pari parity in their um, senior management ranks. Oh, wow. um, right now, the, level, the, the data in the US, I think, the latest data that I have is from two years ago is around 50% of the work, 48% of the workforce is women compared to 52% men. And as you go up one level above, managers 38% women. Hmm. And as you go higher, one level higher, that number decreases radically. Hmm. Now to answer your question, how long is it going to take? Um, I think there is a big movement right now that is happening and there's a lot of, you know, consciousness. What's going to be interesting is, is to see how, you know, the women that I work with, which are at the mid-level, senior level, uh, how this generation is going to start building, push through and build the next generation of managers, senior manager directors and so on. Yeah. Um, it, it might take a little while. It might take a couple of generations because what happens right now is that the few women that make it to those higher level uh, on the on through the ranks on the corporate ladder, they um, quite often uh, they have to exhibit those you know more masculine traits mm. um, to just survive to just being able to be out there and being able to um, be seen as you know strong and not weak basically in the amongst men at those you know meetings you can picture you know a high level c suite meeting with only men and one woman and, and she has to just be seen strong and can't show any weakness so she starts exhibiting those you know highly masculine traits that can come across as um, negative for other women she starts there's a phenomenon around um bully managers female managers and women against women mm. um this is what's happening right now. And I think it's gonna take a couple of, you know, generation of 
of new managers to be able to change that trend and create an environment where there's less toxicity and women start helping one another to climb up the ladder. Are there practical steps for somebody that's maybe uh, an executive at a business and they say, you know, I want to, I want to make room. I want to make sure that we're uh, allowing room for qualities, feminine qualities and women uh, higher up in our organization. What are some practical steps that uh, business owners, business leaders can do for that? Um, so, you know, I think the first step is to pay really close attention for, you know, toxic behaviors. Um, and you were asking me, you know, how, how likely are we to change the, the trend, you know, in the Me Too era, and there's a lot more attention being paid to the dynamics between men and women, but paying close attention, not only to that, but also, um, looking at when, you know, the natural, uh, female tendencies are being, um, um, kind of misused and let me explain this um, with an example you know women tend to want to make sure that everyone is okay and want to help and very collaborative very helpful and it's very hard to to for them to just let something break or let something not happen so mm. When there is, when we need someone to organize some extra activities for the team or, you know, make sure the meeting room is going to be ready for the big meeting and, and you know, coffee and, and copies and so on, you know, women, it's hard for women to not want to volunteer hmm. and it's on managers to make sure that there's a culture of volunteering throughout the team and that it's not just the one lady in the team or just women that volunteer to help out and take on those tasks. There are not um contributing to their career progression that are contributing to the team's you know well-being but not contributing to their career mm. progression and the way they are perceived so being able to create that you know volunteering um a habit throughout the team is really important another thing that's been interesting and this comes from um you know uh feedback that i've heard from groups of women working in tech there is a, um, a tendency of, you know, trying to help based on good intention, but doesn't really help women. For example, mm. you know, um, a male uh, colleague or manager is saying, oh, what Michelle is trying to say here is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and that happens. I heard stories of, you know, yeah. women, ma ma male trying to help and, and actually accentuating the, the, the issue of, you know, women not having a voice at a meeting. So this would be some, some, you know, kind of very subtle ways of subtle things to pay attention to. The, the biggest, you know, thing that managers can do is, you know, when they're looking into hiring for diverse talent, look at the way the job descriptions is written um, and inviting women to apply to roles they don't feel like they fit 100% of, of the description of. Some of my clients are applying to their dream job and they want to make sure that the, the job description and their resume is in a hundred percent map. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be because, you know, roles kind of can change depending on the talent. So being able to pay attention to that will help uh, managers and leaders to bring more uh, women on their teams. Yeah. That's always been so interesting to me. My wife and I will joke about that when we'll both look at a job description that we could probably do. I'm a, I'm a lot more confident. Well, you know, I hit maybe 60% of the stuff. I'll just give it a shot. But there's all that those statistics out that women are looking for what, like 80, 85% match on that if, or they're not going to apply to it. Exactly. There's, um, there's that and there is the, the, the habit or the tendency to want to be hyper prepared want to have the, you know, an additional certification, want to do more training, want to do more, 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 more preparation in general. That risk-taking trait is a very, you know, masculine trait. Hmm. Um, and a lot of the work is about encouraging women to take risks and be okay with, you know, failing and be okay with not being perfect. You know, when you go to school and your skills are doing very good at school, they got, they have the best marks. Right. Um, this habit of, you know, studying hard and get the degree is something that is really deeply ingrained in, in most women. Hmm. And that's a habit that we keep on, you know, applying to, okay, I want to be super ready. I want to match hundred percent of the criteria before I, I go for it because that's what we've been encouraged to do. 
So are those some of the mindsets you tackle with your coaching that you're, you're kind of identifying some of the things that will keep them from getting those next jobs? I, uh, I, we, we've talked a little bit about the, I guess the systemic stuff that maybe keeps women from taking those next steps in executive coaching, but what are maybe some of the ways that women can work on their own mindsets um, in, in heading towards those opportunities? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of talks and talk around self-confidence or like thereof. Okay. Um, and the mindset change is around self-confidence or confidence is not, is not something that you have or don't have. Um, so I, the work that I do is a lot around, let's create a plan, a strategic plan for risk taking so mm. that, you know, my clients can learn how to build that confidence and be okay with failing, be okay with not getting those good marks. Yeah. Um, this is really important and it's, they don't have to be ready to, take the next step, which is, you know, things like networking, for example, networking is a big subject as well. A lot of women say I'm not good at networking, hmm. but they are, they absolutely capable of reaching out, making a connection on LinkedIn yeah. right, or a coffee and having those conversations. Again, there's that sort of um, fear of failing, fear of not being good enough hmm. or, or, you know, stepping into that sort of unknown. So that's part of the, the sort of mindset work that, that we look into. Um, another thing that is really important and that really helps with uh, raising the profile of women and helping them climb the rank is around um, being okay with uh, letting things break. Hmm. Meaning that um, if you want to be an effective leader, you have to be able to prioritize and you have to be able to let the teams, your colleagues and people around you take on responsibilities that you, you are, you've been taking on prior to that. Um, mm. And they might fail, they might not do it right. And you have to right. be okay with that. That's something that it's not necessarily just a women thing, but that- um, that's, um, that's a manager thing. You, you, you watch people that they, they were so good at the job that they can't let other people do it and not do it well. Exactly, they were doing it a, a different way. And, and um, that desire to be, you know, a hundred percent match or doing everything perfectly, that perfectionism is hindering um, women, men also as well, to your point, anyone who's looking into managers, but it's hindering them in um, their, their rise to the next level, basically, whether it's a people manager, people leader, or a thought leader, yeah. um, you know, being able to have those difficult conversations, it's not always about agreeing with of everybody um this is something that is part of the learning how to let things break basically yeah i'm grateful i i, I think i've had a, a lot of good opportunities i've worked for some strong female executives and with some strong female leaders and um i there's been times where i've missed even relational dynamics on the team that they've been very helpful to me on and uh to your point about networking i think that they have so often, I mean, that's, that's a broad stroke, right? But so often they've been great at connecting with people and making them feel seen and heard and stuff like that. So I find such value out of uh, the work that they do. Yeah. I think the collaborative um, aspect of the relational um, traits and, and, and behaviors that women exhibit is really helpful to keep everyone together and pay attention to folks that might not be, um, speaking up in meetings, you know, hmm. or the sort of introverts, shy types, uh, women will pay attention to them. And it's not saying that men want or ma male managers want, but it's something that they are more aware of, making sure that everybody's okay. Um, something that you said, we lost my, my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's awesome. So um, I'm sure that there's some ladies out there that are interested in this coaching that you offer. You, you offer through Fierce and Charming Coaching. How can, how can people connect with you next, Marian? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so fierceandcharming.com is my website. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, working specifically with women that are currently doing good, want to be doing great, I um, feel like they're not getting to the next level because of frustration and discouragement. And I'm not ready to just quit and want to want to get to the next level, whether they're looking into getting promoted in their current role or promoting themselves with, with uh, a next role, with finding the perfect next job. 
And um, yeah, um, they connect with me uh, through one-on-one -on -one coaching. Everything is online. And um, anybody who's listening right now can go on my website, fierceandtriming.com, to uh, learn a little bit more about one-on-one -on -one coaching or grab my free guide as well that has six techniques to be seen and, and make yourself more visible and show up as a leader in meetings. Those are the techniques that I've learned, um, especially at Amazon, you know, in such a big company, really understanding how to be able to um, create more visibility for yourself as a next step to getting promoted. Wow, that's awesome. I, I love the name Fierce and Charming. I think that's just going to catch on it like wildfire. And so I wish you great luck and all the best in this endeavor. And uh, thank you for the stuff that you shared today. I think it, it's very useful and helpful in, in our work. Thank you so much today. It was a pleasure to be here and chat with you and your audience. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, stay healthy leaders and we will talk real soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.